Good afternoon, Gary. Thanks for making time to see us on the uh, Responsible Tourism Day at WTM. A couple of easy jet people on panels next week, and we'll perhaps talk about that a bit. But it's a real pleasure to have Gary Wilson with us. He's the CEO of EasyJet Holidays. Gary, how has COVID been for you? Yeah, good afternoon, Harold. Um, it's great to, to join you. Um, and as you know, I'm a, a big supporter of the uh, WTM Responsible Tourism. So it's it's great to be able to join. It's, it's sad not to be able to join in person, but but all, all, nevertheless, you know, it's good good to be part of this. Um, yeah, it's, it's as for everyone, it's been a a very strange and very challenging time. I mean, I think that that you know when we look back on this period um, from a from a, from a company point of view, all of us, I think you know that there are two big elements to it. I think there's the business element, and then there's the human element as well, the people element. And I think that you know if I, if I look at both of those separately from a business point of view, I mean clearly for us, we had just launched EasyJet Holidays. We were a brand new business. We were super excited about you know the future and what that was going to bring and I know the industry had a real buzz as well about what EasyJet Holidays was going to do in the sector and then you know a couple of months in I think about eight or ten weeks after launch you know we then started hearing um of of you know of the the virus and then by March you know we were bringing all of our customers back so it was a real a real disappointment um for us I mean I think from a business point of view we had designed a business where you know, we, we had planned out all eventualities, but we had never actually experienced any of them as a business. As individuals, we all came from different backgrounds and had experienced, you know, how to evacuate a resort, whether it be to Ash Cloud or change your travel advice or whatever it might have been. But, you know, to, to, to have to evacuate your entire um, customer base, you know, within a matter of days and test those processes live, um, became um, very challenging, but actually, you know, we 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 put them in place well, I think, and, and we actually we actually executed those really well. When I look at you know how the team kind of rose to the challenge, I think we were the first major tour operator to bring all of their customers back. I mean, and that's that's really part of the, the the size of the network that EasyJet had that we were able to bring all of the customers back within a few days. And then really it was a case of looking at how we can refund customers. I mean, interestingly, at that point, um, because we only had launched and we had launched on a set of, you know, brilliant value holidays with handpicked hotels, um, you know, digitally, digitally enabled. I think that, you know, we thought, how can, you know, how can this episode reflect what we want to stand for in our customers' eyes? And it was therefore really important that we brought the customers back on time. It was really important that we engaged with them and we explained the options, whether that be cancelling and moving to another holiday or giving them a refund. Um, and, and again, really, really proud that we were one of the few operators who refunded all of our customers within the, the requisite 14 days. So from a business point of view, big challenges, you know, hurdles to, 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 to overcome, which we've done. And really, we've been spending the last few months planning for the resurgence, looking at destinations that, that you know, that we believe that we can make a big impact on um, from a business perspective and working with the hoteliers, working with our destination management companies, working with local and national government, just to really plan for when this will come back. Um, and, you know, that's taken a little bit longer than any of us anticipated. But, you know, it is just a matter of ensuring that you've got all of the plans in place, you've got all of the steps in place, that when, you know, things start to lift, that you're able to act and then you're able to get that business back to normal as quickly as possible. I think when I look at it then from the, the other side, from the, the kind of human side and from the side of, of, of the people working with us, I mean, I can talk about this, about my team, but I can also talk about myself. You know, I think that, I think it's fair to say that for all of us, you know, when, when we first went into the, the kind of working from home and not going into the office, et cetera. And um, it was a bit of a novelty because people think, oh, this is new. We've not tried this before. You know, we were getting into spring, you know, it was, it was, it was challenging, but it was, it, it was novel in some ways. And there was very much a kind of a finite time to this. You know, we thought that this, this will end in three months or in six months, we'll all be back to the office. We'll all be reflecting back on this. I think as it's, as it's prolonged, then we've seen um, anxieties within people, certainly with myself, I think, you know, this is this you know this is this has gone on longer than we thought you know this is becoming more challenging some of the temporary steps that we would have put in place like you know 
having your laptop and a pile of books and a kitchen table, you know, that doesn't sustain you for 12 months if you're going to be working from home. Um, therefore, we've had to work very closely with our teams in, in really understanding what their needs are. Because, you know, I'm lucky I live in a house that I've got, you know, spare rooms I can set up as an office. Um, but some people are in sh uh, uh, flat shares, you know, some people, you know, are, are working from a kitchen or, or, or working from shared spaces. And really, we're working with them to make sure that they've got the equipment that they need, that they're taking time out, that, you know, they're not sitting at a desk from nine in the morning till five in the evening, that the whole idea of working from home should be a flexible one and that people need to be able to take time to you know, engage with other people to, 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 you know, speak to other people, to use tools that are available, you know, to help kind of stress and anxiety, to, to go outside, you know, and, and just take those breaks. And what I try to do with, with, with my team is be very close to them. I, I speak to them. Um, I speak to all of them um, every fortnight. Um, and we have as much engagement as we possibly can with each other just to make sure we're checking in. I mean, one of the advantages we have is we're quite a small team compared to some very, very large organizations. Um, but, but we really try to look out for each other and make sure that each other, uh, we understand what everyone is going through and we're there to help and, and support where we can. And here we are at the beginning of November, the nights have drawn in. Exactly. You really know. I mean, the only chance really to get out for a bit of exercise or to go for a walk is going to be around the lunch hour, isn't it? So I guess yeah. people are going to be taking longer lunch hours and working yeah. more into the evening or starting earlier in the day. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing, actually, the other important thing is is encouraging people to take their holidays because, you know, that 10 days you would have taken in July and August, most people haven't taken that because they're, yeah. they're head down really working through. And therefore, it's really important that whilst you might not be going... <clears throat> overseas you know for a, a 10 night beach holiday you know it's still really important that you take that time just to kind of relax to decompress and and, and just to get get yourself back together again and, and that's another thing that I think we absolutely have to encourage through those winter months is as you say that that middle of the day part when people can go out and get a bit of daylight and you know you know um, a bit of exercise we allow that but also that we're encouraging people to take the, the holidays that they should be taking. Yeah. Gary, I was very interested when you talked about your planning for the future. Mm. You actually talked, and, and it's not something I've heard. I've heard you say it before, but you don't hear it often. You talked about thinking about the, the destinations where you could have an impact on the economy. Yeah, yeah. And that's the usual perspective, in my experience, for a tour operator. To think well, about. Do you want to just unpack that a bit for yeah, us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know that I'm, I'm quite a passionate exponent of, of responsible tourism and, and, and also just the, the kind of the, the economic, the social, the environmental, the impact that tourism can actually make in the world and in the destinations that we operate in. I think from EasyJet Holidays, we're in a fortunate position that because we don't have that legacy of, well, we're, we're huge in Turkey or we're huge in Mallorca or we're huge in... In, in Greece, you know, we can actually sit and look at, you know, where are the areas that we really want to make a difference, um, that, that we can, you know, really get behind, that we can really ex extol in terms of, of, of tourism and, and, and really make an impact positively um, on those destinations. And, and we've taken time to really think about that. I mean, I think that the strength that, that EasyJet has with its network, because we have so many aircraft and we fly to so many destinations, we don't just cover the big primary destinations. We fly to many of the, the, the secondary and very small destinations. And I think often, some of those areas, you know, they've got fantastic um, offerings from a tourism perspective, but they just never get the, the headlines or the, the, the attention maybe that some of the bigger areas get. And I'm a real, um, a real exponent of, of getting behind those and seeing that, that we can do everything kind of to help those destinations as well, because I think that's where we can really start making a positive impact. I think also it's come into really come into view um, these last few months, if you think about it, you know, kind of social, environmental, economic, I mean, that's really at the heart of what people are going through at the moment, you know, the, the, the focus on community and communities, I think, has never been stronger, because people are feeling this impact, whether it's, you know, Manchester area going into tier three, you know, whether it's national lockdowns, you know, we're all being affected as communities. And when we look overseas at, at different countries and different areas in the world, we see how those communities are coping. So I think, I do think that, that, that approach to community and how 
we behave within tourism as a community and with the communities that we impact is going to be super important when we come out of this. Um, because no longer, I think, is, is it going to be acceptable that, you know, you fly into a destination, you stay for 14 nights in an all-inclusive, and then you fly back out, um, and you really don't have any engagement or understanding the impact that you're making on those areas that you're going to. And of course, um, we've seen the growth of the, of the desire among, in the consumer for the experience to be a richer and a more engaged one. We're crazy yeah, yeah. if we don't acknowledge that, aren't we? Yeah, huge, huge. And, and, and when we did our, our, our research, again, setting up the company, I mean, the demographic that we have is, is probably a, a slightly younger demographic than maybe the traditional tour operators would have. And it was loud and clear that they wanted experiential travel. You know, they don't want to just go to a destination and just sit on a sunbed for, for seven nights or 14 nights. They no. want to experience the culture of the destination and they want to see the authenticity of the destinations that they're visiting. Um, and it's really important that we're able to bring that to them. So I think that social aspect is important. I think the economic aspect is, is hugely important as well. You know, I think that that we will, you know, we're seeing already the massive, massive impact that this is having on, you know, big organisations and, 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 and organisations like ourselves, you know, who, who, you know, will weather the storm and we will come out of this and we will rebuild, you know, the, the the businesses we need to but there are many smaller much more fragile companies who you know will be really finding this very difficult and that also goes for smaller economies um economies who are totally reliant on tourism um for for, for their prosperity and they are really going to be finding this difficult and i think as tour operators as a tourism kind of industry we have a responsibility to ensure that we are absolutely getting behind those communities, those people and those destinations as soon as we possibly can, because it's decimating their economies. Um, and, you know, the sooner we can we can get flying and we can get back, the better, I think, for those economies. Well, um, one of the destinations that you and I both know quite well is the Gambia, and they've been, they have closed their borders because the health service couldn't cope with COVID. So they've managed to protect themselves in health terms but the economic damage in the Gambia must be really dramatic. And there are many places yeah. in that position, aren't there? I think you're right. I think that that kind of enforced isolation that some have had to, to, to put themselves into, because as you say, they don't have the infrastructure um, in order to be able to cope with a, with a big influx of the pandemic, you know, is, is helping them in the short term, but in the, the medium to the long term, there's going to be big effects of that. And we need to absolutely ensure that we're able to be there to, 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 to help and support when we can. Can I just bring you back to community, Gary? Because again, yeah. <laughs> not many tour operators talk about that. The um, one thing that struck me is that whilst we, we can individually protect ourselves from COVID by isolating ourselves from the community, that has bad impacts on our mental health, but it does make us realise that we, we can't live in isolation. Climate change is a different kind of problem, isn't it? Because whatever we do, However wealthy we are, in fact, we can't isolate ourselves from the impact of, of, of climate change. And I really to wonder whether we could use the experience of COVID to get people to think about climate change in a more active way. That it's something that we, that we all do need to address, not only in the way we go on holiday, but throughout our lives. Do you think that's something we could conceivably use to shift the way we think about climate change? That's something we have to address and control. I think it's a I think it's a really pertinent point, a really good point, Harold, because I think you know when you think of it in the context of the pandemic, um, when the pandemic struck, you know, we saw on CNN and on BBC, you know, these these images of you know communities being shut down and, and towns being being isolated in China. And yeah, it, it was it was curious, but it didn't affect us. Yeah, it didn't affect us, and it was like, gosh, that's that looks serious, but actually we went about our daily lives as normal. Yeah. I think actually started affecting us. And you think, gosh, this is affecting, you know, what I can buy in the shops. It's affecting how I can go about my daily life. It's affecting how much I can see my family or how much I can, can do things that I would take for granted. There's an absolute parallel, I think, there with climate change that, you know, as, as we know, this is coming closer and closer to impacting our daily lives every day. And I think that people do need to use that as a parallel to think, you know, what can I do now? And I think that's the important thing that, that you know, even, you know, even up to recently, I think a lot of people who accepted that climate change was an issue, but well, what's my individual contribution really going to do to impact this? 
And if you think that, that overcoming this pandemic, it's all about individual um, behaviors and individual contribution, that's the only way we're gonna beat this. If everyone acts together, in order to do what we need to do in order for this to go away. And I think that's exactly the same in climate change. We all need to take it seriously um, and think about our individual contributions that we can make. And interestingly, when you work up the kind of the hierarchy on that, that, that also is very true to, to, to tour operators and to companies. You know, we need to think about when we are, you know, when we're taking people on holiday, you know, what are the, the, the impacts that we're making negatively and what can we do in order to make sure that the net impacts we're making are positive? So what is our approach to the hotels and the energy they're using, the way they're employing their staff, where they're sourcing their food, how they're using their water? These things are going to be so vital, I think, that we need to be able to answer our customers this is our policy, this is what we're doing, this is how we're working in conjunction with the private sector and government in order to ensure that we're all able to, 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 to make our part. I mean, I think, I think just, to, just to, to add to that, the, the time of you know, going in to look at a tour operator's programme and saying, this is the, the main programme, and actually here's the little programme with a green flag on it where you make an impact, that, that's gone. You know, that's gone. It is a responsibility for all of us to make sure on the end to end, however little it may be, we're all doing something um, that is that is trying and is aiming to make a positive impact. Gary, I can hear people in the audience wanting to shout out, you're talking to an airline. Yeah. Um, we need to talk about the aviation piece. Now, we, yeah. we've got a pilot on the decarbonising aviation panel next week from, from EasyJet. Yeah. Uh, we've got Jane Ashton, who many people know well in travel and tourism. Yeah. Uh, on the final panel, talking about how we can make tourism better in the future. But I, Gary, can you just say something about how you see the role of aviation and the future I, of aviation? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a it's a really interesting point. I think actually looking at it in the context of what's happening with COVID, you see that the impact on people's lives when you cannot visit destinations and travel, and you know. People want to travel, people want to connect with other communities, connect with other cultures, connect with other destinations and other countries. Um, and you know, th th that, that is what we try to do. We try to connect those people with, with those places that they, they, they wish to go. But I do think that, you know, there is a part to play. You, you have to be as responsible as you can on this. I think that, you know, for, for too long, you know, aviation dragged its heels. And I think that we have tried as, as much as we can in the last few years. I mean, we, we launched the carbon offsetting and um, where, you know, all of the, 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 the fuel that's used on, the, on, on flights are, are, are offset. Now, of course, that's not the answer. It's not saying, well, that's us, we've done our part. It is a step in the right direction. It is a step to say, we take this seriously. We understand that this is a big issue. You know, the fact that we're the biggest consumer of carbon offsets, I think globally, does, show our intent that we want to do the right thing within this space but behind the scenes you know we've also been looking um at, at things like you know the amount of weight that an aircraft would carry and therefore the amount of fuel that it consumes you know taxiing on one engine as opposed to two which cut down um you know emissions and, and also we're, we're a big sponsor into um electric energy with, with, with an aircraft that, that we're working um with airbus on and also you know we're absolutely open um, to support any kind of renew renewable energies or, or any new technologies um, that can help cut carbon. But I think, I think the blunt instrument of saying, well, just don't fly, you know, we can see the impact that just not flying is having on the world at the moment, the impact on, on people's health, the impact on economies, the impact on, on community. And I think that, you know, we need to look at responsible, mature ways in which we can do that. And I, I mean, I'm really proud. I joined EasyJet because I know that they really take and we really take this seriously and it is something that absolutely as a board member of the airline as well as um the ceo of the holidays business it's absolutely at the top of our agenda to make sure that we're doing everything that we can in order to address this that was very clear and so i watched the appointments you made um gary as you moved over and it was quite clear that this was this was deadly serious that it was not yeah. just a, a smoke stream but it, it it does seem to me the problem is not flying any more than the problem was was trains in 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 the 19th century the problem was the fuel yeah and it's the burning it's the burning of a fossil fuel which is at the heart of the problem of aviation yeah. and one of the things i hope the decarbonizing aviation panel would do 
is encourage people in the travel and tourism industry to be saying to the aircraft manufacturers and the engine manufacturers that actually, come on, you've got to get this sorted now. You've got to get on to a clean fuel. And we know that technically that's possible. It still needs a lot of investment. But I think the industry needs to be demanding of the aviation sector, the people who build the planes, not so much yeah. the people who fly them. But you fly them as cleanly as you can, but you don't determine the technology that you can purchase to put into your planes. That's determined by the manufacturers. And I think that's where the pressure needs to go. Well, I think there's probably nothing more important on their agenda either, because I think it, it is, again, about the business case. You know, as businesses, you know, if, if, if we were to look forward 10, 20, 30 years, you know, it, it's just not going to be an economically viable business, you know, to, to have your entire production burning fossil fuels. Of course it's not. And I think that, you know, the, the, the project that we're involved um, with Airbus on in terms of the electrification um, and, 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 and flying electric planes, you know, that's very much at the forefront of the focus of, you know, what are the new technologies that we can embrace? You know, what are the investments that we need to make as a, you know, as an industry, not, not just the aviation industry, but as you say, the manufacturer of the planes um, in order that, that basically we're meeting the requirements that customers will have, but also our responsibilities that we'll have in the future. And interestingly, you know, if you talked about that 10 years ago, it seemed a very, very long-term um, far off goal. You know, it's not a long-term goal anymore. You know, in, in the 2020s, up to the mid to late 2020s, this will need to start becoming much more, you know, part of, of, of kind of regular travel in terms of the introduction of this. Just in the same way that, you know, when you walk down the streets of London, you look at the amount of electric cabs there, you would never have foreseen five years ago that, you know, X percent of the cabs would be would be purely electric. And, and you know, it just needs to start happening. And, and yes, there needs to be pressure from consumers. There needs to be pressure, pressure from people like us, you know, who are operating the aircraft right up the, the, the kind of supply chain in order to ensure that that absolutely happens. Gary, thank, thanks for that. I think it's, it's extremely clear that we do need to put the pressure on the manufacturers. C could I just ask you, as we come to the end of this, of this interview, just to, to say as clearly as you can what the business case is for responsible tourism? Um, I mean, I think that, that you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's disappointing in a way that, that, that in 2020 we still have to talk about the business case because to me it's been so clear for so many years what the business case is. And I am glad to say that, you know, when I speak to hoteliers, when I visit destinations, they get it now. They understand the business case absolutely. You know, I think from, you know, from a cost point of view, in terms of, you know, how much, you know, how much energy, how much kind of cost yeah. on energy, on water, on investment, these hoteliers are going to save is phenomenal, you know, if they were to embrace, you know, a way in which the, the, they're doing things um, responsibly. You know, I think when I speak to hoteliers who've adopted either renewable energy or they've, they've got, you know, um, protocols for how they deal with wastewater, or they've got protocols for how they deal with air conditioning and electricity within their hotels. They say, you know, that the immediate benefit is to our bottom line, because, yeah. you know, we save money by doing this. And the investment that we have to make up front is significantly smaller than, than the payback we get very, very quickly. So, so, you know, I think that cost element is absolutely there. I think the second one, just from a consumer point of view, is that we know, I mean, it's, it's study after study and tour operator after tour operator will tell you that customers who take holidays to destinations which have a, 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 a mature and a well thought out cohesive responsible agenda to hotels who adopt kind of responsible tourism and their ethos, you know, they come back much more happy, you know, they have a much higher repeat level. Um, to go back to these destinations and to go back to these hotels. And again, the impacts are economic if you don't want to look at anything else. You know, therefore, the, the business case is absolutely clear. If you want to have happy customers who repeat, you want to have, make more profit um, by, by doing the right investments, then absolutely it's the route to go down. But I think more important than maybe when I was talking about this five years ago or, or, or seven years ago, is that if you don't do it, you're not going to have a business. It's just not going to exist. People will not will not continue to go to your destination or go to your hotels if you're not willing to, to, to accept that this is absolutely core to, to what you do and how you operate. Yeah, it does seem to me that there's a whole new generation of travellers coming through, many of whom will are already influential, they've become more influential as they move up the hierarchies, who've had a completely different educational experience. I mean, eco, ecology wasn't taught when I was at school. Um, no, it's no. now standard in the syllabus. 
more and more people know what an aerated shower looks like and they don't like yeah. it when the shower is not aerated yeah, you know the, the market is changing and it's changing very fast in fact yeah old, old people like me are no longer the major market you know it, it it has changed and i think you're absolutely right the the industry needs to recognize that big change in its consumer base and that's around the world it's the consumers in india and china as well it's not just europe anymore absolutely and you know the other thing harold i think that's, that's vital is that you know again when, when i talked about the the tour operators program the, the little section for these are your eco holidays or your green holidays you know the idea of an eco holiday you know to a lodge in costa rica you know which is run by a family and, and you know that's absolute that, that's vital and that's that's still absolutely um you know crucial and, and 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 important but you know where i think i can make personally an impact and where the big players can make an impact is your two and three hundred and four hundred room hotels when yeah. you look at the amount of food that they're consuming if you can have a way of, of of locally sourcing that food direct from the suppliers and paying the communities directly who are buying those a bit like i think um the the, the travel foundation did within fetier where they did a taste of fetier where they looked at the community of farmers and how we could actually work directly with those to supply the hotels that's incredibly powerful from a, a very wide economic perspective and um, the same if you if you ensure and you work with your partners on things like employment you know the employment rights for the people who are working in the hotels and you know how much they're earning and you know what their conditions are like you can make a huge impact um on on, on a large number of people by just putting these policies in place and working with governments who rely on tourism you can make a huge impact as well so i also think this idea that kind of big business is bad i think that's completely been flipped in its head big business who act responsibly can make a massive positive impact and that's where i see my myself playing a part is really trying to drive that through at the highest level that i possibly can Malcolm, I know, uh, sorry, Gary, I know you're as passionate as I am about Scotland. I was talking with Malcolm Roughhead, doing an interview yeah. with him. Um, and he was saying that they, the Visit Scotland has started to do more work with the events industry. They hadn't previously yeah. done much. But he said, looking at how many suppliers those events companies have, you know, 500, 1,000, 5,000 in one case, the, the local economic impact of just that part of the industry, let alone, the whole thing is is massive and we perhaps haven't thought enough about that in the past i think no, he's absolutely, absolutely on to something with that as you are at easy jet holidays yeah and i think i think the other thing actually interesting i spent the last few months in scotland and and you know a little bit of a you know a, a sideway from 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 what i'm doing but but in terms of i i come from and an, another house in a little island in the west coast of scotland and and you know absolutely beautiful but it's not really on the tourist track and you notice you know the cruise ships going past and all the customers going past as they visit the more popular islands on the way to sky or on the way to these other places and it has made me think again in the last few months about how can you spread some of that benefit across some of those lesser known communities because actually you know they're just lesser known because they're lesser talked about it's not that they're less attractive or that they have you know less natural resources and i think that you know having a kind of policy not just in Scotland, but but generally in how we work, that would say, well, let's look at the the, the the country as a whole and look at some of these communities and areas that we can really bring kind of positive impacts to by encouraging customers to visit those as well. That also helps answer some of the over tourism issues as well, which I know is a completely different issue. Well, I'm not know. sure, Gary, I'm not so sure that it is. I was thinking when you talked about the ecotourism and those kind of bits of the business years ago. Yeah. When we started working on responsible tourism, I got I was criticised a lot by people from that area. In fact, the, in Kerala, where we've had brilliant success with responsible tourism, there was actually a demonstration in 2008 against the first responsible tourism conference held in Kerala. Right. And it was because people were saying, you're, you're just the, the vanguard of the big operators. You're just using ecotourism to get in there and wreck our community and you know i have to be honest i live in a small town twenty thousand people we want visitors but we want yeah. visitors who we invite and on our terms so i just wondered how you feel when you watch a cruise lines going by do you do you really want them to come to your community or or do you do you have some concerns about the impact if they do no i think two things i mean i think that the balance needs to be there and i think you know I think the the unfortunate kind of product that that over tourism sometimes has seems to have produced is that 
you know, I'm maybe being a bit dramatic, but you end up with sacrificial lambs. Yes, you know, absolutely. You have one area to almost become destroyed in order to try to protect other areas. Yeah. And I think that's that, that's no longer viable because what do you do? You just Once that's gone, you just move to the next one and move to the next yeah. one until they're all gone? Or yeah. do you adopt a kind of um, a much more broad brush approach that looks at it in its entirety and said, how can we ensure there is a percentage share going across this piece and, and that, you know, it's not all just focused on one area that we can actually start talking about some of the brilliant um, the brilliant things there is to do and to experience within other parts of this. So I think that in order to do that, there needs to be engagement with those communities again. You know, I think they need to be invited to, to sit around the table and talk about, you know, what they want from tourism. And yeah. I think by doing that and by engaging them and allowing them to feel that they have some control and and, and some kind of, um, they are a stakeholder in their own future is, is absolutely vital. Um, because I think if you speak to them, they would say, we don't really feel we get anything at the moment. And, you know, we're too small a voice to make an impact. I mean, if, if you look at some of the, 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 the small kind of Italian areas around the area, how do they compete with Venice? You know, they say we're not Venice. How do we compete with that? They need to be given that platform by which they can they can compete. And, and, and people need to take a chance in which they're saying, you know, we're not going to go here. We're going to go there instead and, and let you see and experience that. So I think that's really vitally important um, that they're given that platform. And that also the operating actually take the chance with them as well. I think that's right, Gary. And it brings us right back to that expression, which is in the Cape Town Declaration. You know, the question is, are you going to, is your community going to use tourism or is it going to be used by it? And yeah. there's that wonderful um, proverb that you often hear in the Far East, which is that tourism is like, is like a fire. You can use it to cook your food or it can burn your house down. And yeah. uh, that exactly sums up what the challenge is. Yeah. Gary, that's amazing. Thank you very much. We've got opportunities to discuss these themes again. and We've got some yeah. of your colleagues on panels next week. Um, but thank you very much indeed for, for spending time with us this afternoon. It's been a fascinating interview. Thanks, Harold. It's been, it's been great to speak to you and good luck with the rest of the, the week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary.